This video is by Straight Goods News, sgnews.ca. Yeah. I mean, the, the courts have been actually very explicit about how you would go about canvassing for people who actually didn't exercise their democratic franchise, given the secrecy uh, of the vote and the need to preserve it. So this isn't a situation in which you go door to door and actually ask people whether they voted and how they voted. And we had to establish both of those things in order to make out our case. So it isn't just that a certain number of people didn't vote, because if that number is spread evenly among all of the political parties, the outcome of the election would obviously or arguably be the same. So we had to establish two things, that uh, a certain number of people didn't vote, and that certain types of electors were less likely or were more likely to have been deterred from voting. So we needed to invade, in a sense, that secret space that voters are entitled to preserve uh, with respect to information about whether they voted and how they voted. But the only way you can do that is to conduct an anonymous survey, and that's exactly uh, what we did. And we're looking, I mean, 6,800 people are a substantial number of people. Now, what Mr. Hamilton has said in, in one of the earlier motions we argued is that we actually needed to find everybody and have them swear an affidavit and then Mr. Hamilton would cross-examine them. That's simply not something that the courts have indicated is permissible uh, in, in when it comes to the secrecy of, uh, of somebody's ballot and whether they vote. So we went about it, uh, I think, in the only way the courts have indicated one might do this and that's to conduct uh, a, a, an anonymous survey. In civil proceedings, an allegation of fraud is to be established on a balance of probabilities. This isn't a criminal proceeding. The courts have been very clear about that. Um, She's not happy. I'm not, well, I don't think the Opitz case was uh, criminal either. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I follow. But that, and no fraud was alleged. No. So that was fine in the Opitz case. But you are alleging fraud. Yes, but I mean, the Supreme Court has decided that in civil proceedings, and this is a civil proceeding, uh, where fraud is an issue, it must be established on a balance of probabilities, not on a criminal law standard. That, that's clear. Uh, I mean, it's being disputed by the uh, respondent and members of Parliament, but, uh, and there are some legal issues that are uncertain in this proceeding, but not that one. So can I just, is it okay? Um, to, just while you're there, um, the core of your argument <coughs> against this latest conservative submission is that you don't need to get over that bar of producing actual people who actually did not vote. That's true. Is that right? Yes. Because in OPITS, the court established a, in a way, a double-barreled test. You know, was there... Uh, were there irregularities in OPITs sufficient to call into doubt uh, the, uh, the tally? I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But the other part of it, the other part of the test was were there irregularities sufficient to call into question the integrity of the electoral process? And so before you get to this magic number test of having to establish that so many people actually didn't vote, uh, you may get over the bar simply by establishing that what took place really did call into question the integrity of the electoral process. And that's sufficiently serious to warrant the judge exercising her, her or his discretion to annul the result of the election. I mean, under the Act, there's a two-fold test. We have to establish that there was fraud that affected the outcome of the election. And if we succeed in doing that, we still have to persuade a judge that her or his discretion should be exercised to annul the result of the election. And it's that second test that the court spoke to <coughs> by identifying um, this in a way double-barreled uh, test uh, for guiding that exercise of judicial expression, the discretion.